And I just pressed the Let's Go Live button, so let's wait for the stream to fire up. All across the fruited plain of the internet, before we go ahead and get started, we got to make sure that the tubes are connecting themselves because we've got some serious business to attend to. And we don't want to just start rambling all over the place. Oh, you know, talking about this and that and the other thing, and it's not even working. But it looks like things are alive and well. Of course, we are on Facebook. We're on Rumble. We are on Locals. We're on YouTube. We're on Twitter. We're on all the places. Did I already say that one? I don't know. But it looks like we are alive and well, which is tremendous news. So that means we can go ahead and get started. And let's do it. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney broadcasting from the Valley of the Sun, deep in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. And today we're talking about a motion to dismiss some serious criminal charges brought against the Proud Boys. We've talked a lot about the January 6 cases here, the so-called end of America, insurrection, end of democracy, all and on and on for two years now. And we are still going through a trial. This is the Proud Boys trial. You can see this photograph was from several months ago. Actually, this trial is now in day 34, and it's not over yet. It was actually a pretty explosive day yesterday. We're going to go through and recap everything. You're familiar with the Proud Boys. They have been in popular culture ever since the 2020 election when Trump was asked to disavow them. And he said, you know, stand back and stand down and stand by or something like that. And they all said, what? You're an insurrectionist. And we know what you're doing, Trump. And they said, you know, he's endorsing a white supremacy and all that stuff. And so they've been around forever and they were really, really just hurting to charge somebody with seditious conspiracy. And so these guys got it. But trial hit a moment of fireworks yesterday. We're going to go through the trial thread, including the trial today. We've got two pretty explosive motions to go through. One is about impeaching an FBI agent. Her name is Nicole Miller. And there's rumors around here, the defense is alleging, that she hid thousands of pages of communications that she was supposed to disclose to the defense. Okay, it's absolutely crazy. I can't even understate it. And we're going to go through it. They're saying, like, she was, she, she's, do we have all of your documents here, madam? And she said, yeah, you do, definitely do. It turns out she only gave him 26 records. There's like a thousand other ones that are missing. Okay. And we don't know why. So they're saying that they're going to impeach the heck out of her. They're put the judge on notice. And they also got another motion from Dominic Pozzola. This is a juicy motion to dismiss. And this one comes on the back of the Tucker Carlson videos, right? The January 6th videos that have just recently come out like two minutes of additional new security footage. And then this was enough, as we said, right? Did this, was any of this disclosed? Did the defense attorneys know this? Because we've gone through the Jacob Changely sentencing and we know the government was putting together their highlight reels of all the worst things that could ever possibly happen on January 6th. And they just shoved that in front of the judges. But what about the opposite side? Did the defense have that opportunity at all? We don't know. We, we weren't involved in it. And the defense that was representing Jacob Chansley and all of the other people, they were all bound by insane protective orders, so they couldn't disclose this stuff out publicly anyways. So we don't really know what the other side looked at, but now we do. Chansley, his lawyer, showed up on Tucker Carlson yesterday and, you know, it's weird, weird, um, weird individual. And it's basically been our position on him since the beginning. However, you know, I'm very reticent to condemn or criticize other defense attorneys, but you know, we'll go through that. Now I went back and I looked at the most recently fi recent filings for the Jacob Chansley case, and there's not much going on. He's still actually out here in Safford, Arizona. He's supposed to get out, I think in July of this year, I believe I just looked it up and uh, we're going to go through two things. And there were 12 video exhibits that the prosecutors submitted. And so we're going to you know, ask ourselves whether there was a defense opportunity as well. And then there were some interesting clips still in reaction to Tucker. We've got one from Kinzinger. He's saying, you know, I could just manipulate the footage if I wanted to and show you whatever I want. He was criticizing Tucker and he said, you know, anybody can just manipulate footage and just show you whatever they want to show you. And we're all sitting here going, yeah, yeah, I know. That's the point. Hello. Gosh. Not that right. Maybe that's why he's not in Congress anymore. Yes, I know it was a redistricting. Here, this is Schiff. He says, if you tell a lie long enough, then people will believe it. And you're going, what year are we in on January 6th now? 
<laughs> what year? How long are you guys going to go? Yeah, how long is the lie going to keep going? And then we've got Tucker who showed up on the Glenn Beck show. And he said something very interesting about the rest of the media and how they are interfacing with him. And so we'll get back to that one in a little bit later. But my friends, as you can see, we have a lot to get to today. And boy, oh boy, if you want to be a part of the show, one of the best ways that you can do that is by becoming a member. And one way to become a member is to join our locals community, which is at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And if you're a Rumble viewer, that's kind of the place to go for the Rumble community. So come on, join us over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And we also want to shout out our YouTube members. So Curtis Bartle, for example, shout out to Curtis Bartle. It's in the house right now. Curtis Bartle says, he, he, he didn't say this. He said early birds earlier, but he just gifted five memberships to our membership community on YouTube, which is just awesome. That means that all of our members get our private telegram group. So no matter where you are, get access to the link, join the private telegram group. It's the persistent chat that goes on and on and on. So when this live stream ends, you can still hang out. And we also do our after party there on Telegram. And we also do our uh, morning headlines and our morning streams and stuff all there as well. So come join up at watchingthewatchers.locals.com or on YouTube as a member. I also want to invite you to try to get your daily servings of fruits and vegetables in if you can by getting your field of greens at fieldofgreens.com it is a real organic superfood daily servings of fruits and vegetables taste great taste delicious going down the vegetables want to be eaten that's why they're here they're very happy they're disappointed actually when you don't eat them so you can go to fieldofgreens.com don't forget to use code robert you'll be bursting with green energy the good kind you're going to like it and also a, for, a shout out to my former law firm the rnr law group they are helping really good people charged with crimes find safety, clarity, and hope. And so if you know anybody who's in trouble in Arizona, they're still available. Send them over to rrlawaz.com so that they can help. All right. And so let's get right into it, my friends, because we've got some serious business to attend to. The Proud Boys trial hits a major rub for the prosecutors. Looks like it may have been derailed by two motions which may have a moderate chance of success given all of the revelations that we have seen relative to the January 6th cases. Today, we're gonna to talk about two major motions, one from Dominic Pizzola, who filed a motion to dismiss. This came after Tucker Carlson released additional January 6th footage. Of course, we've covered all of that here, but we'll highlight the footage that is being referenced in the motion. They talk about this guy, Kevin McCumber, and it's a spicy motion. Now that we're seeing there's, a lot more evidence that apparently the defense never got, we start asking ourselves about very important concepts like Brady materials and like the Jenks Act, which is something that we're gonna talk about in detail today because another motion was filed on behalf of Ethan Nordeen, which was another Proud Boy, is another current Proud Boy defendant. He filed a notice of impeachment saying that this, def this FBI agent, a special agent goes by the name of Nicole Miller, I don't know if this is her. I just got an FBI agent, generic person. And she allegedly, according to Ethan Nordine's defense lawyer, hid a lot of very sensitive information from the defense, and it accidentally got exposed in trial. And it's all related to Jenks material. So we're going to go through all of this. But first, let's understand where we're at in the context this is the Proud Boys trial. It is day 34. Holy moly. Talk about a long trial. Now, this would be a long trial because we've got five different co-defendants. And of course, we know this is the greatest attack on American democracy since the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So this is what the latest minute entry looks like for March 9th, 2023. See that as of today, here is the minute entry. And we're on day 34 of this trial. So they are really hoping to wrap this up quickly. We've got six different defendants. You see Ethan Nordine, Zachary Real, Eric Tario, Enrique Tario. We heard a lot about him, covered him at length on this channel. Dominic Pizzola, Joseph Biggs, defendants. Now they were in court today. The jury panel was not present. They had oral arguments and we are gonna go over to a Twitter thread and read through what happened today, courtesy of Roger Parloff. He's on Twitter at Roger Parloff. So we'll go through those oral arguments. The jury trial was postponed, okay? So they continued it out until next week on the 13th. 
that is going to put us on a Monday. And the reason they're doing that is because of all of these motions. Motions to dismiss came in. The judge is like, oh, man, the defense is saying you guys hid evidence for, from us that was exculpatory. And your special FBI agent is a giant liar on top of it. So the judge goes, oh, crap. OK, well, we're going to just take the rest of the day off and we're going to come uh, back on Monday. And we'll get into it. So the parties who are here, we have a bunch of people who are uh, committed, still incarcerated. We've got Timothy Miller, defense attorneys. Uh, the reporter was Timothy Miller. Defense attorneys are going to be Nicholas Smith, Hull, Pattis, Hernandez, Hassan, and others. And who was also there was the FBI special agent, Nicole Miller. Okay, so that was what happened today. Now, I want to show you this Twitter thread, which is from our friend Roger Parloff, and we've covered, he does great work sort of reporting on some of the federal trials. The problem with covering the federal trials is it is not publishable. They can't stream it. They're not going to put it on YouTube. They can't even audio record it. They won't allow you to do anything with any of that material, which is a major bummer. But Roger Parloff is typically there, I believe. And so he lives tweets these trials. And so if you want to follow him, I'd encourage you to do that at R. Parloff. He is the senior editor over at Lawfare, journalist, published in a bunch of different locations. A great follow. So make sure you give him a follow. Now, this is what he says. All right, everybody. Proud Boys trial, March 9th, day 34. I'm live tweeting this on Lawfare. He says, the government's extraordinary grand finale continued yesterday because they were about to end this with their closing arguments and put all these insurrectionists away forever. But it ended snarled in mistrial motions. That's weird. These, these trials, the reason we have not been covering them is because it's like paint by numbers, uh, color by the numbers, you know, books. It's been very mechanical. The DC judges just, we, we talked about several of them here. One of them was the Steve Bannon trial, but they are just sort of rubber stamping these things going through the motions. And so we say, holy moly, mistrial motions. What's going on over here? He went through all of that yesterday. But he's going to jump off his thread with this. And so I want to make sure we read this issue. He tells us, the issue that really spawns all of these defense motions was a spreadsheet that was provided to the defense from FBI agent Nicole Miller. Okay, this is a spreadsheet from her link, which is the FBI system, sort of like an internal communication system. You know, we use Telegram for our community conversations. Businesses use Slack. Others will use Facebook, you know, business or whatever. Workplace, Google Chat. This is like the FBI's version of that, right? Link, when they all send messages back and forth. So among others, there was an FBI agent named T. Wang. And so this spreadsheet just came out. And we're going to go through that in a quick minute. You can see what it is. But it's very important we understand what Jenks-related materials are, right? Jenks-related communications. And I want to just pause briefly to go over that because this is what the U.S. government says about it. Now, the, this came from the DOJ manual from 2015, right? The Department of Justice, they put out these documents. We got to train all of our prosecutors on how to deal with those defense lawyers, Ugh. you know, and so they have to learn how, what all of this stuff means. And so I grabbed this from a 2015 manual, I believe. And here's what the DOJ says. All right. Put yourself in the position of a January 6th defendant, right? You're facing these charges. You're asking yourself, what can I get access to? All right. I've been charged with a crime. The government put me in custody. We have no access to any body cameras. We have no access to any Capitol Hill surveillance footage. We're in solitary confinement for 22 hours a day. We can hardly talk to our families. We really have no ability to communicate with anything. So how, if the constitution says that you've got some procedural rights and some due process rights, how can you possibly defend yourself if you don't have access to the evidence? It would be like if you were charged with a DUI case and they just took your blood and they said, oh my gosh, you were super drunk, man. And you say, well, can I see the evidence, please? And they say, oh, no, 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 it's okay. We don't need to share any of that with you. Well, I, I need to see that in order for you to convict me. Don't, don't I need to see it? Well, no, you don't really need to see it, right? These are these discovery problems. And if they don't give you that evidence, how can they possibly prosecute you? They can't. 
And so if there is no blood result, if they lost the blood and they can't disclose the blood, well, they can't convict you of a blood related crime. And so we ask ourselves, what duties do the government have to disclose information to you? What do they have to give you and what do they not have to give you? You've heard about Brady material. You've heard about exculpatory information. And so there are some things the government absolutely has to give over to the defense. And there's other things like the opposite of that, that they don't have to give to the defense unless they actually use it. It's sort of like the opposite. So let's go through this. Now, if you're a defendant, this is a government prosecutor and they've got to navigate through all of these issues. So now we put our hat on the government prosecutor hat. And this is what, what they get in their instructions. They say, all right, assistant U.S. attorneys in the criminal division must be familiar and fully comply with their discovery obligations under the rules, under the Jenks Act and federal rules of evidence and the Brady cases, right? So you've got a lot of different rules. This stuff is super important. You can win criminal trials by mastering these rules. In addition, they say that U.S. attorneys should also be familiar with obligation imposed by district courts. And this, it's, this came out of Northern California. So you've got general policies and then you have local rules for the different local courts. But they give us some of these discovery obligations. First, Brady material. We're all very familiar with this. The government disclosure of material that is exculpatory, government disclosure of material exculpatory and impeachment evidence is part of a constitutional guarantee to a free trial. The law requires the disclosure of this material if it's material to guilt or punishment, right? If the government has access, they have the whole briefcase. If they open up the briefcase and they have something in there that you should probably have, they got to give it to you. If they find somebody else's fingerprints on the murder weapon and you're in custody for the murder and somebody else there's like, well, you know, that's weird. It's called two sets of prints over here. And we got his, I mean, he's already in jail, but we also found this other set of prints on the knife. I mean, I guess, but we already got him. All right. All right. For, so forget about that. We'll just put that other set of prints. Just forget about that. Right. Uh, no, because you got to give that to the defense, but the defense would never even know if that existed. So the government has an obligation to give that out. And if they don't give that out, this case can be dismissed. So they are constitutional obligations. They have to comply with it. Now there's an opposite side of this. And so if you want to look this stuff up, please feel free to do it. These are some of the things that the government must disclose. Oral statements about interrogation, relevant recorded statements the defendant's prior record, all of those things, right? A lot of rules surrounding this. And then these are the local rules that would you'd see out of a local court. So then what this is really going to involve, a, a lot of this is going to, two things, right? Brady, I think we're a little bit more familiar with. If there's a second set of prints and they don't give them to you, they don't tell you about that, that's a problem. If there's a second batch of videos that show that your client is actually not doing the things that you're alleging in the other videos, well, then you got to disclose those because you can show a different narrative. For example, if you say that Jacob Chansley was racing in to take over the Senate, well, if there's other videos that show that cops were opening the door for him, maybe your conjugation of the, the narrative, the way that you, you reframe the narrative is inaccurate and the defense should have the opportunity just like that second set of fingerprints to see the second set of videos to make their arguments that the other person did the thing. So that's Brady. Now on the other side of that, you got these defense lawyers like yours truly who are sitting around all the time on these fishing expeditions. We're just out there just like, oh, well, you didn't disclose that to us either, did you, Mr. Prosecutor? Guess what? We're gonna file a motion to dismiss because you didn't give us what we asked for. And so then we as defense lawyers, the prosecutors say to us all the time, they say, you guys are just on a fishing expedition. You don't have the right to get any of this material. Who do you think you are? And, and, it, and they say to the court, they say, well, judge, if we give them this, then they're going to ask for this and this and this and this. And then that's going to overburden our prosecutor's office. We're going to be so overworked. We're already government employees. We have a hard time putting our shoes on in the morning. But please make our lives easier judge and don't make us comply with all of these discoveries. So we go back to like the DNA, the DUI analogy right now, if I go and I say, all right, well, I've got questions about what you did with that blood sample. 
And I wanna see what that test machine did, the gas chromatography machine, how that functioned on that one particular run of blood vials on that one day. And they say, well, we might give you information about that one batch run. And I say, well, I've also got questions about the run that you did before that and the run that you did after that, the day before and the day after. And they'll say, well, okay, we'll give you those. And uh, maybe we'll give you those. But if I say, I want all of the data for all of the batches that you ran over the last six months, because I want to see if there's been one single error in any of those DUI samples. If I want to comb through those with a fine tooth comb, right? Most courts are going to say, get the heck out of here. Okay, they're going to go get out of here. You don't need any of that stuff. And, and that's to sort of stop the defense from going hog wild and demanding everything. So there's this other act called the Jenks Act. And this one is a little bit smaller, you'll see here, than the other uh, bit of information for Brady. So under Jenks, the government must produce the prior statement of a government witness, but after, right, this is key, but after the witness testifies or on direct examination. All right. So we have a situation where a government witness drafts a report and they sign off on it and they rely on the report, but they haven't been called to testify yet. This is just kind of floating around in the government's file. We have this expert witness and they created this thing and the defense is saying, well, I want that. Uh, give me your expert and give me his expert witness report and I wanna see everything that's in there. And the government says, well, I haven't even used this at all. I haven't even used this material. Like, we're not even gonna use this. We don't even know if we're gonna call this expert or anything. And so this rule says, okay, well, the, the defense can't have it before they talk, but if they talk and if they testify, then the defense can get it after. Okay, this is important because this FBI agent that we're about to hear from, or this motion is gonna be involving, she testified, she referenced a batch of text messages, and then that batch of text messages went over to the defense, and the defense then found a problem. Okay, so this is a Jenks Act, Jenks material problem. Federal rule of criminal procedure implements the Jenks Act and sets forward the principles for it, but you see here it says the government must produce the prior statement of the government witness after the witness testifies on direct exam. Okay, so these are two big broad buckets of problems we're gonna see. Brady material, what does the government have to disclose but didn't? It's gonna be in the form of really videos. And Jenks material, which is going to be what the government did actually disclose after the witness testified, that is a giant problem that opens up a whole can of worms. Now there's also 404B evidence and tons of other stuff here that is you know, sort of getting into the weeds. But now that we see that, this is what this issue is about. Let's go to the direct motion. So back to the mind map, we can see this is part one of the arguments that are being made in court. After day 34, the defense filed uh, two mo monster motions asking for dismissals and notifying the court that they're about to impeach the person who just testified yesterday, FBI agent Nicole Miller. Here's the motion. Filed March 9th in the DC Circuit Court, Proud Boys case involving Ethan Nordeen as defendant, a defense motion and notice of argument in support of the impeachment of FBI agent Nicole Miller. Now they're writing this yesterday. Yesterday, says the defense, Government witness, special agent Nicole Miller from the FBI ugh, was cross-examined by the defense. So the government called her to talk about why the Proud Boys are seditious conspirators and why they should be prosecuted. And the defense asked her a bunch of questions. During cross-examination, she testified that she understood her legal duty under the Jenks Act, which we just talked about, to produce written statements relating to her testimony. So they say to her, all right, FBI agent, you're smart, right? You work at the FBI. You know here that when you're done testifying, you have to provide the materials that you're referencing in your testimony. You understand that, don't you? Yes, I do. So the FBI agent, Nicole, she says, yeah, I know that. I acknowledge that, yeah. And yes, when I produce that material to you, 
those statements are going to be in the messages that I give over to you. So just like your Slack messages, just like our Telegram messages or your Facebook work messages or your Google chat, the link messaging system is going to contain everything that I just told you, Mr. Defense Attorney. I'm not hiding anything. I'm here under oath. I know I've got to give you those statements. All from the link messaging system, which is what the FBI uses. This is where bureau employees communicate with one another. So Nicole testified that in order to comply with the rules under Jenks, she compiled her link messages in an Excel spreadsheet, and then she gave that over to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So FBI agent Nicole says, I know I, I know I was testifying here today, Mr. Defense Lawyer, and so I've come prepared. In fact, here's a Google sheet of everything I need. It's, it's an Excel spreadsheet. It's all right here. And he says, great, because as soon as you're done here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to see those messages that you're talking about. And she says, no problem. I'm smarter than you defense lawyers anyways. And she says, here's a thumb drive or something. So the defense attorneys here, and let's just make sure we're given proper attribution on this outstanding motion, to Dave B. Smith, hailing from Alexandria, Virginia, and Nicholas Smith. Don't know if there's a relation, but shout out to the Smiths. They say, okay, well, we were just cross-examining this FBI agent. She says, yeah, here's my messages. It's everything I got. Here it is. But the version, says the defense, the version of Nicole's Excel sheet that she produced to the defense, it contained 25 rows of her messages, which is weird, right? Only 25 messages? Like, that's not that much at all. I mean, look in our Telegram. Every night we wake up in the morning, there's like 600 messages, right? We got an active, vibrant, intelligent community there. And so 25 rows is not, not that much. So the defense says, okay, well, during cross-examination, Agent Nicole acknowledged that she alone compiled those records. Nobody else helped her with that. She did it herself. She testified that in cross-examination that those messages constituted everything, a total production. All her statements from Link, that she's complying with the rules. And as we know, the discovery tells us that it is a must, right? They must produce it. We also know that discovery violations, when they hide things, according to the Brady rules, they're pretty much material. They have to follow those because those are constitutional obligations. Oh, man. So if they make some pretty serious discovery violations, that might result in a dismissal of a case. Hmm. Hopefully that doesn't happen for those prosecutors. Now, they say this is the defense writing. However, those 25 rows? No, not so fast. A close examination of Agent Nicole's sheet revealed over 1,000 hidden Excel rows of messages. Huh. You're kidding me. That's weird. Why would there be a thousand hidden rows of messages that were hidden of Excel rows? I don't know. Strange. Uh, Miller was thus examined as to whether she had withheld from prosecutors those link messages. Not good. Hey, Nicole, this is this is your production, 25 messages. And that's all? Yeah, that's everything. Did anybody help you with this? No, you assembled these yourself is what you're saying. Yes, government didn't help you. Prosecutors didn't help you. Nope, 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 nope. Your boss, superior eight, nobody helped. Nope. Okay. And this involves everything that you talked about here. There's nothing else in here that you need to disclose to us. This is everything that you have an obligation to provide us according to the federal rules. Yep. So then... The defense says, we examined her to ask about these messages that were very conveniently hidden. They've got questions about whether the messages contain any of the following. All right, so uh, Nicole, so it sounds like you've got a lot of these messages that uh, are, are missing. Do any of those messages involve a conspiracy charge about the Proud Boys case in particular, whether it was justified or not? Do the facts support a conspiracy charge? Did your messages talk about that? We're going to find out. 
Uh, Nicole, did your messages talk about a Telegram user, somebody called Aaron of the Bloody East, who was involved in, quote, planning chats? Who would that be? That wouldn't be like a federal agent who was involved in, quote, planning chats, right? That couldn't be somebody called Aaron of the Bloody East, certainly. You wouldn't have hidden those messages, would you? Um, you wouldn't have, have hidden messages about inaccurate FBI informant related information about whether that should be disclosed to the defense, which would be a Brady problem. You weren't talking about inaccurate FBI information in your messages, were you? On your Slack message, FBI secret Slack channel, were you? And Miller said, no, 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 no. I wasn't answering. I wasn't, uh, no. She's like sweating bullets right now because she's sitting on the stand. Wow, that's weird. Only 25 messages? Are you sure you didn't talk about conspiracy charges? You, you don't remember any person named Aaron of the Bloody East? And she's like, oh crap, I'm doomed. Did I delete those rows or did I just hide those rows? Did I, she going, did I send them the right file? Holy crap, I thought I sent them the most recent file, version, version 10. Did they get version nine? Oh gosh. And he's just going one through one, one by one. She says, no, 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 I didn't do any of that stuff. Negative, 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 negative. But the defense says, but Miller, the, the FBI agent Nicole, was also cross-examined as to whether Nicole had gained access to the content of attorney-client privileged communications involving defense trial strategy. Holy moly. Okay, so that's great, Nicole. We're really glad that you didn't didn't uh, hide any information about informants, about planning chats, about factually supporting a conspiracy charge. But but did you listen into the phone calls between any of the clients and their lawyers? Did you do that? Again, Nicole answered in the negative. Now, however, the defense says, however. The agent's hidden link messages do contain statements concerning each of those issues. You're kidding me. As to the question about whether agents could make a valid conspiracy out of this case and, quote, not make a fool of themselves was her language. That's included in the messages. You can see these messages were sent through the FBI Slack system. And these do look like Excel rows here. And so she probably just hid these up, just highlighted all of them and press hide. Thought it deleted them or something. That's the FBI. When I tell you they're playing with crayons over there and playing Where's Waldo, searching around for what Waldo in photographs and playing with Legos up there, they are. So these were some emails, you know, back and forth from one FBI agent. These are some messages from one FBI agent to another. And so this says um, at uh, February 1st, 1806, somebody sent a message. Yes, what a effing idiot. Okay, so W-O-T, right? It's typical FBI vernacular there. Not very sophisticated texters. Yes, what a effing idiot. Somebody says back, it's really good. Yeah, the, it's the entire MOSD chat. Enrique didn't delete anything. I'm going to send you another one too. Okay, so they're in the chat. Enrique's in there. They probably invited him to a Telegram group or something, and it has all the history enabled. All right, these guys were not insurrectionists, conspiracy theorists, seditionists at all. They were just dudes. And they're being pinned on this thing. So they weren't ultra secretive or anything like that, right? This is all mostly done in the open. He says, I'm going to send you another one too, which actually has Enrique talking about what the plan specifically is. They make mention of Dick Schwetz, whoever that is, on page 15. At least I'm pretty sure it's Dick Schwetz who they're talking about. Another reason I want to get in front of him. So they're just talking about it. You know, they could, again, you're allowed to plan to show up in protest places. You're allowed to have clubs and, and free assembly with other people. That's allowed in America. You are not supposed to be infiltrated by rotten FBI agents. 
but they did it anyways. So he says, okay, somebody says, so will this get us over the hurdle of the conspiracy charge? You see how rotten these people are? They know they don't have anything to charge these people with conspiracy with. And so they're be begging for it. They're jumping into their chats, whatever the plan is, right? They could be planning to go to a, you know, a picnic there on the Capitol lawn. And they're going to say, perfect. We got those white supremacists now. Enrique Tarrio is not even white. So this is nuts. And they know that their case is weak, but they're saying, well, will this get us over the hurdle? Because if not, we got to manufacture something else. And they're literally chatting about it. That's how non-obvious the crime is. The crime of the century, so-called, is so non-obvious, they don't even have enough to get over the hurdle. And the FBI agent lied about it. Did you talk about any of that? No, 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 we didn't. You did. And the, the materials you disclosed hit it. So then another message says, okay, so long as we can actually go after them with conspiracy and check this out and not make a fool of ourselves. See that? It's too late. You guys should probably take a class on using Microsoft Office. And then maybe you'll avoid lying. Don't do that. All right. It's helpful for us defense attorneys. Fortunately, this was uncovered. Thankfully, it was disgusting that it had to be uncovered. And hopefully there's some recourse for it, but we'll see what the judge does about it. So they are talking about worry, being worried about not making a fool of, of themselves because the conspiracy charge is such a joke. But that wasn't the only thing that was in her messages. There was also an issue about whether somebody who was a co-conspirator called Aaron of the Bloody East, whether he wasn't too involved with the Proud Boys planning chat, which was a subject of Miller's testimony. Okay, so Miller presumably took the stand. This is Nicole, FBI agent Nicole. And she's up there talking about Aaron of the Bloody East. And there's, she takes the stand. Is any of this going to show up in your Jenks material? Nope, nothing is. Should have. Here it was. She says, I don't see any emails from Aaron past the six, even though there are emails as late as yesterday. And listen to these people, these two FBI agents. I also want to know if his house got foreclosed, right? They're just snooping on these guys. I don't think so. He wasn't involved with the planning chat, nor do we know he was down there think he had to work. And somebody says, I mean, if we really want to work all the PB members, he's the one to go after, especially his PayPal, his wife's PayPal and her Venmo account. Go get his wife too and get her Venmo. These little FBI agents snooping around on people's stuff, just trying to wreck their lives because they disagree with them politically. And they're trying to fit a narrative. Says, just listen to about seven min minutes of yelling Zach to Amanda, LOL. Not yet. Haven't come across that one. Ha ha. I'll bring beer. I just got it today. There's a good amount of calls on it. You see what these people are doing? This is the professionalism of the FBI. They're joking around with this stuff. I'm listening to nine minutes. This is not, you know. I've never been a government prosecutor. Thank the Lord. Never would be. But this type of sort of conduct to sort of hide this material, I don't know who hit it, whether the FBI agents hit it or whether the prosecutor hit it for this to not come out, for all of these people to sort of just be so jokey about this stuff with everything they do, I'll bring beer as they are trying to create a narrative. They know, they said previously that they don't even think there's enough there for a conspiracy charge. They're debating about how to make it stick so they don't make a fool of themselves simultaneously while they're dunking on his wife's PayPal account, her Venmo account, and his PayPal. They, they don't even have enough there. But if they want to go after all of them, they're going to get beer and popcorn, and they're going to listen to the calls like you know high school kids going through a stash they found, right? It's insane. That's the FBI. Now, the FBI agent, Nicole, maybe also, we're going to see, could have lied about this too. No conversation, no admission about whether there was an agent and a request to Agent Miller to go into a CHS report, look at this, and edit out that the agent was present. So retroactively go back into a confidential human source report 
and edit out that the agent was present. You see this from this email address, row 11159. And boy, we look at all these thousands of messages. So she just thought she did an export, huh? This is B121. Oh no, that's 8122, 645, 6485. Look at all these rows, man. Okay. So we're now at 11159. N. Miller sends a message in the FBI Slack channel, their link system. It says, you need to go into that confidential human source report you just put out and edit out that I was present. See that? Nicole Miller says, go into the report that you wrote, delete out that I was present. That's what the defense attorney got. They didn't make this row up. This row came out from the FBI, apparently from Nicole Miller. She said under oath that she's the only person who put it in there. Why does she need to edit that out? And why is the FBI so open and brazen that they're sending this stuff out? I, I mean, unless she wasn't there, maybe she wasn't there right? If she actually wasn't there and they put her in there, well, that's obviously wrong. It's, that's factually inaccurate, but I doubt that's the case. Just saying. Now, we also have another question that Nicole presumably hid. The 1776 returns document, they asked her questions about it. There were questions about whether that document could, quote, solidify the conspiracy charge. So a message either to or from Nicole Miller at the FBI sends the 1776 returns document. Okay, so this document that the Proud Boys are probably passing around in their Telegram group or whatever channels they're using. So they say 1776 returns, you know, something like, we're gonna take our country back. We're gonna get this, this nation back on the right path or something like that. And these whack job psychopath FBI agents who don't even know how to use Microsoft Office are saying, this might solidify the conspiracy charge, looking for anything because they're sharing this document. But they say, but the Capitol building wasn't listed nor circled for, quote, the occupation. That's weird. They say, would that be an issue? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, if you're trying to say that they were creating a conspiracy to insurrect the Capitol and they don't have any preparatory material for that, yeah, that's an issue. But why did you delete that, Nicole? Why didn't you just include all of this honestly and disclose that in your Jenks material to the defense after you testified? Why might that be? Now, the defense continues. They say, Miller's, Nicole Miller, Nicole, the FBI agent, her communications with another agent are also included in these messages. We can see them. And it also states that the FBI boss assigned her 338 items of evidence I have to destroy. Hmm. Nicole Miller's communication has another a conversation with another agent who states that her boss said destroy 338 items of evidence. I don't know what that evidence might be. What could it be? The defense says that from the hidden rows in Miller's link spreadsheet, FBI Nicole, it is apparent that the defense has not received all of her Jenks statements in these relevant communications, right? We talked about a lot of things and she didn't give us the materials that she's obligated to give us under the federal rules. That is because the individuals with whom Miller, FBI Nicole exchanged messages can be seen responding to the agent, but her own statements are missing. So for example, consider the below hidden messages in Miller's link spreadsheet regarding Aaron of the Bloody East. So it's only capturing sort of one side of the conversation. We read those emails, those messages. At 1912, an agent responds to Miller saying, I don't think so, wasn't too involved with the planning chat, but the Miller message to which agent was replying is missing from the production. Wow. So it seems it is necessary, says the defense, and appropriate to cross-examine Miller with messages like these for several reasons. So the defense is now asking, judge, she's not on the stand anymore. She testified 
We asked her all these questions about the materials. She gave us the report after she testified. We got the Jenks material. We went through the spreadsheet. Turns out she's a giant liar. So we would like to bring, or we think she is, allegedly. And so we would like to bring her back onto the stand to cross-examine her again now that we have all of her unhidden rows. Why should we be allowed to do that, Judge? Several reasons. Number one, Miller testified that she had not gained access to the content of attorney-client communications involving a defendant in this case. FBI Nicole further testified that she had not withheld linked messages from prosecutors about the following issues, whether the conspiracy charge was actually factually supported, whether the Telegram user Aaron was involved in planning chats, whether inaccurate information should be disclosed to the defense. All of those messages were hidden and all of those messages impeach her testimony. It shows that she's lying. Extrinsic evidence impeachment as to credibility, says the defense, is always permissible unless it pertains to a collateral matter. The basic, so this is going to her credibility. This is not going to the issue as to whether or not the Proud Boys are guilty, right? This doesn't, this evidence of her secret messages, it doesn't necessarily, it's not being used to exonerate or to, to convict the Proud Boys. It's being used to blast the credibility of everything that this woman has said. So you got to be careful about how you use the evidence. The basic test for determining whether a matter, matter is collateral. And so they give us some rules here. They say the very definition of Jenks material is that it relates to the subject matter as to which the witness has testified. They say, secondly, since Miller has completed her direct testimony, Nordeen is entitled to move the court to order the government to produce her statements in the government's possession related to her testimony. We read those rules. The above hidden messages from FBI Nicole suggest that the government does possess unproduced materials from the FBI, but the government cannot now communicate with that witness to confirm the fact that she has not completed her testimony. And no rule bars Nordine from inquiring in cross-examination as to whether the witness made statements that were not produced. It would make little sense. The witness is in the best position to answer the questions. So they say, finally, Nordine must be permitted to cross-examine Miller with her hidden messages. This is about the confrontation clause, right? Got a right to confront your accuser. And we have violation of the government attorney communications uh, attorney-client communications about trial strategy. More rules here. They say, Judge, the privilege here, if you allow this to happen, if you allow them to just jump into our conversations, you might as well just get rid of all attorney-client privilege entirely. Just get rid of it. The privilege would not exist for anything in our justice system. Therefore, Judge, respectfully submitted your friend David Smith and Nicholas Smith. Great motion. Absolutely love it. Shocking that all of this stuff was so hidden and so revealed that they were able to extract it and bring it to light. So that is the Nordeen notice of impeachment. Now that is a little bit more of a technical motion. You can see that Nicole Miller got on there, said a bunch of things. They asked her for evidence backing up her statements. She gave it to them. The evidence she provided exposed a ton of other materials that she, we, we would say lied about. She would say, no, I misremembered or it's not relevant or whatever. Major issue. Her credibility is in the garbage. And now we're going to see what the judge does about it. But that was just one. Now we have a whole separate filing. And before we get to the filing, I want to refresh our recollection about Jacob Chansley because Jacob Chansley is referenced in this motion. And we were speculating that as this material became more and more public, as Tucker Carlson started to expose it, what would this do? Was this going to trigger a bunch of post-conviction relief efforts for the people who've already been convicted? Because maybe they didn't get material that they should have gotten. People often think of appeals as you go to trial, you lose, you appeal your case. But what happens if you decide to plead guilty? Right, you go in, you plead guilty. The officer says, I've got you convicted because I've got this evidence against you. And you say, uh, you know, nine months later, that officer gets indicted for falsifying evidence. And you go, wait a minute, 
that was the officer in my case. He said I had uh, drugs in my in my purse. I didn't. I took a plea deal because I was scared to go to prison and I just got probation. So I took it. But now that officer is a liar. I think he lied in my case. Do I have any recourse? I can't appeal it because I took a plea deal, which is what Jacob Chansley did. Is there any other recourse? Is there any other action? And so for Jacob Chansley, we think about petitions for post-conviction relief and other opportunities to try to reopen the case, even though it's a long shot. But that's a separate issue. Now, we also have a current case that it's open right now. This is, of course, the Proud Boys case. But the footage from Tucker Carlson is still relevant to them. I mean, talk about timing. They are in day 34 of their trial. They're about to get convicted on probably a whole slew of different things. But for this lying FBI agent and but for Tucker Carlson releasing the video. Now we get a big juicy motion to dismiss saying that they failed to disclose Jake's material and exculpatory material. It's like Christmas, man. You can't ask for better timing. And so before we read through the motion, let's familiarize ourselves with what happened one more time, courtesy of Tucker. And this was the clip relating to Jacob Chansley. Conspiracy theorist dressed in outlandish costume who led the violent insurrection to overthrow American democracy. For these crimes, Chansley was sentenced to nearly four years in prison, far more time than many violent criminals now receive. What did Jacob Chansley do to receive this punishment? To this day, there is dispute over how Chansley got into the Capitol building. But according to our review of the internal surveillance video, it is very clear what happened once he got inside. Virtually every moment of his time inside the Capitol was caught on tape. The tapes show that Capitol Police never stopped Jacob Chansley. They helped him. They acted as his tour guides. Here's video of Chansley in the Senate chamber. Capitol Police officers take him to multiple entrances and even try to open locked doors for him. We counted at least nine one, officers two, three, four, who were five, within six, touching seven, eight, distance nine. of unarmed Jacob Chansley. Not one of them even tried to slow him down. Chansley understood that Capitol Police were his allies. Video shows him giving thanks for them in a prayer on the floor of the Senate. Watch. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for paying the inspiration needed to these police officers to allow us in this building. Contrast the reality of what Jacob Chansley did in the Capitol building on January 6th. The industry. So that footage is going to be what triggers this motion. They're saying, we never saw any of that. And we need that information in order to make our defense possible. Just like you need knowledge about the second set of, fin of fingerprints on the knife, you need knowledge about the second set of videos for your client. And so the defense submitted a beautiful motion. Let's take a look at this one. Filed out of the District of Columbia, the cases against Dominic Pozzola, one of the Proud Boys charged with a slew of crimes from the January 6th riots. This motion submitted March 9th, 11 pages long, and it comes on the heels of the Tucker Carlson release of the new J6 footage. The title of this motion is Defendant Pozzola's Motion for Dismissal with Prejudice. We like that. Or in the alternative, if the judge isn't willing to do this, if the judge isn't willing to slap the government and say, you guys have really breached protocol, you have violated constitutional rights, so egregiously that the penalty is it's dismissed with prejudice, meaning it's not coming back. If you're not willing to do that, Judge, which is a big ask, right? That's a big, that's like Super Bowl home run victory, blowout victory. But if you're not willing to do that in the alternative, we want a mistrial. All right, so we, could, we might have to come back and do this all again, but we still want a mistrial on the recent revelations involving Tucker Carlson, involving the associated testimony and the discovery of massive Brady and Jenks violations and violations of due process and the Sixth Amendment. Whew. Love it. Checking all the right boxes. The defense says. Defendant Dominic Pozzola, by his lawyer, Roger Roots and Stephen Metcalf, shout out to Roger and Stephen, hereby move the court for dismissal of the indictment with prejudice, meaning it is not coming back, due to recent revelations on the Tucker Carlson show and associated testimony in this trial on March 2nd. Also, due to Jenks and Brady violations that were revealed on March 8th, which was yesterday, involving special FBI agent Nicole. 
which established that the prosecution has been monitoring attorney-client communications of the defendants, illegal, destroying evidence and doctoring and fabricating evidence involving confidential human sources. Pozzola requests an evidentiary hearing on this one, Judge. Remember, we are in day 34 of this trial. The Proud Boys have been going through this for quite a long time. Many of them are still in custody, if not all of them, sitting in court listening to these arguments. And Tucker Carlson just happens to run some new footage and shatters the entire narrative as it currently exists. Pozzola continues, says, During the trial on Thursday, March 2nd, the prosecution in this case presented Mr. Kevin McCumber. Now, Kevin McCumber is the deputy clerk of the House of Representatives, and the government called him out as a witness. That is this guy, if you want to know what he looks like, deputy clerk of the House of Representatives. And so he gets called in almost like a police officer. If you're charged with a DUI, the police officer will come in. No, this is what I observed when I pulled him out of the car. The reason I stopped him, the odor of an intoxicating beverage and all the things. He's brought in to say, well, I, I run the House of Representatives and, you know, they were insurrecting my Congress. And so they brought him out as a witness and he testified. That's who they're talking about. Now, McCumber is the highest ranking official of Congress to testify in this case. Mr. McCumber was called to testify starting on March 2nd at about 11.45 a.m. McCumber has been employed by the House of Representatives for over two decades. Ugh, these bureaucrats, man. He has vast knowledge of congressional politics, and he has watched hundreds of representatives interact in the House chamber. They say McCumber's daily duties include being in the House chamber, where he helps run the proceedings of the House, and he records entries in the official House journal logs. Now, during direct examination, the government calls McCumber up and they say, OK, Mr. McCumber. Why don't you walk us through these videos? So McCumber showed the jury the video recordings of both the Senate chamber and the House chamber gaveling into recess on January 6th. So he's the guy in charge of the, the gavel, the bang in, the opening, the closing. He's monitoring all the things. This is when we're checking in, checking out. And so they say, we have to prove as the government that they interfered with a proceeding. Remember that claim? They obstructed the, the counting of the votes. They interfered with the execution of democracy. They delayed the counting. It was like by four hours, right? They voted that same day. It wasn't even a big deal. And if the police hadn't, you know, sort of let everybody in, waved them in and stood down, maybe there would have been a lot less people in the Capitol building. We have video of that as well. Point being, if they need to approve obstruction, if they need to show that Congress was doing a thing and then Congress could not do a thing, they have to show that. And they have to show that these defendants in this case, in this particular motion, Dominic Pozzola, that he interrupted the thing. If they're being charged with inter, you know, interfering with the process, they actually actually have to do the thing. So they brought in this witness, McCumber, and he says, look, they were gaveling into recess. They were supposed to be doing a thing and they had to exit the thing and go to recess. The bell rang, go have fun kids. So prosecutors have claimed now that defendant Pozzola and co-defendants caused Congress to go into recess by entering the Capitol on January 6th, right? We've kind of followed the bouncing ball. Like it's one thing has to cause another thing. If they really did interfere with the counting of the electoral votes, how did that happen? Did they knock on the door? Did they break a window? Did they turn off the electricity? What was the actual interference? They got to make it connect. They can't just, you know, abstractly say there was a raid. We're talking about these specific defendants, not J6 in aggregate. They keep doing that, but they also have to prove it on an individual basis in a court of law, which is where we're getting the actual reality of this stuff, the numbers and the reality of the overbroad exaggeration of this whole thing are coming out in the numbers. Here, several counts of Pozzola's indictment, including counts two and three, they require proof that they actually caused the recess of Congress. Now, during cross-examination, Mr. McCumber was asked about the recess or, quote, the obstruction, right? That's where the obstruction happened. Bang the gavel. Insurrection MAGA Trumpers are coming in here. 
uh, we got to exit this this congressional proceeding and we are done. Now, during questioning by the lawyers, Mr. McCumber admitted that there was no need for Congress to recess on J6. Hmm. McCumber testified that protesters have frequently, at least six times in his personal experience and observation, demonstrated in the actual chamber and on the floor of the House. That's a fun little fact, isn't it? So six times before, uh, other individuals have come into Congress and protested on the floor. At least six times, the government's own witness, the person that they called, Mr. McCumber, is stating that in court on the record. McCumber testified that each time the protesters came in, they were removed and Congress continued. Interesting. But what's curious about this is on January 6, they say no demonstrators ever entered the House chamber at all. They were never even in there at all. Hmm. Huh. They weren't at all. I mean, we didn't we see photos of them like just over and over and over. Or was that only the Senate with Jacob Chansley? Hmm. So they never even went into the House. Now, the defense says for over two years, the government has claimed that some of the demonstrators who were in the halls and outside the U.S. Capitol building obstructed an official proceeding in violation of the law. But the government, they say, has steadfastly refused to identify in what way any of these defendants directly caused the recess of the joint session. How did they do it? Did they kick the door in and, and, and cause them to you know, panic or what? Despite repeated demands for disclosure of this information as potentially exculpatory evidence, whose disclosure is required under the law, Brady versus Maryland. So they keep saying that you interrupted Congress. But how? How did that happen? Nobody even entered the House of Representatives. So why did they have to recess out of the House of Representatives? And we saw other cops opening the doors for the Senate and letting Jacob Chansley in. So why did they have to recess? If they voluntarily recessed, that was from a cause of their own, right? They said, we're panicked. We don't, we don't know what's going to happen. That doesn't mean that Jacob Chansley caused it. That doesn't mean that Dominic Pozzola in this case caused it. So they say that Mr. McCumber's testimony plainly refutes the government's claim that the defendants caused an obstruction. And even if they were on the floor, they didn't have to enter into recess. In fact, six times previously, McCumber, the government's own witness, has said, yeah, there wasn't even anybody. There was no reason to recess. We never did that before. We only did it this time. Why? Because I guess they were Trumpers. Now, but what about the Senate chamber? So the defense makes the argument. They say, look, nobody even entered the House, and they've got to prove that there was actual obstruction with any proceeding. They haven't done that here. They say, even if the House could have continued without recess on J6, they say, yeah, but everybody's going to just say, well, what about the Senate? Whoa. Evidence in this trial has established that for a brief time, around 2.30 to around 3 p.m., protesters did, in fact, breach the Senate for about half an hour. Wow. Inspector Lloyd of the Capitol Police testified that a protester managed to leap down onto the lower floor from the balcony, and that protester then opened the door to let him in. Never during this trial, Never has there been any evidence of any raucous or extremely disruptive or violent demonstration in the Senate chamber. There have been a few images of demonstrators sitting on chairs and standing in walls, but no violence, they say, raucous, disruptive, or violent demonstration inside the chamber. And I agree with that. Ch Chansley was saying prayers for everybody. But then came, the defense says, the Tucker Carlson show. March 6th comes around 2023. Tucker Carlson released a shocking footage from J6 that showed Jacob Chansley calmly walking through the halls of the Capitol with two Capitol Hill police. At one point, one of the officers appears to try opening a door or elevator and then turns and leads Chansley in another direction. Later in the video clips, Chansley is seen walking past nine police officers gathered in the hallway. And his police escorts walk right past nine other officers without any resistance at all. And then the Tucker Carlson show, says Dominic Pozzola and his lawyers, 
They presented footage of officers calmly escorting Chansley into the Senate chamber, into the chamber. The Washington Post wrote that Albert Watkins, Chansley's lawyer, who I have a clip of coming up, was his lawyer through sentencing, said that he had been provided many hours of video by the prosecutors, but not that video. He said he had not seen footage of Chanley walking through the halls with multiple police officers. He says, what's deeply troubling, Watkins said, is the fact that I have to watch Tucker Carlson to find footage that the government has, but chose not to disclose despite the absolute duty to do so, despite being requested to do it in writing multiple times. I have that clip here from Tucker. Let's just jump into that one while we're on it. Here is what he said. But we have a question, which is how in a free country guided by the Constitution were these people allowed to withhold evidence from Jacob Chansley's lawyer? How could that happen? Albert Watkins represented Jacob Chansley at his trial. He had not seen that video evidence until we broadcast it on Monday, and we're happy to have him join us now. Mr. Watkins, thank you. Jacob Chansley's for lawyer. On. If you could just well, restate you. clearly, just to make sure that, you know, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Had you seen that clearly exculpatory tape of your client of course not. at trial? No. We went through extraordinary efforts on behalf of our client to put him in a position of knowledge. That's my duty. Now, this is as an agent. This is going to be standard defense attorney boilerplate language. So keep that in mind of the court to make sure that he knew everything that the government had good and bad to put him in that position to make a learned, informed, voluntary decision about whether to go to trial or take a plea. And remember, this is a man who had tremendous intelligence very gentle, very, very articulate, who was diagnosed 15 years earlier by the, by the government with a mental health issue. And the government knew that. The government knew through three hearings when we begged and pleaded to get this man out of solitary confinement, literally falling into an abyss mentally, and through each of those three hearings, that government assistant U.S. attorney knew the most important aspect of that hearing was that Jake was not violent. The government knew. They knew that Jake had walked around with all of these police officers. They had that video footage. I didn't get it. It wasn't disclosed to me. It wasn't provided to me. I requested it. I filed the requisite pleadings for it, and whether I did or not, they had a duty, an absolute duty, with zero discretion to provide it to me so that I could share it with my client. Uh -oh. So, so very, very simple question. Uh-oh, I didn't like that at all from him. Whether He says, I filed the right motions, uh, but whether I did or not, they still had a duty to disclose that. And I agree that they do have a duty to disclose it, but it sort of feels like maybe he didn't file the right motions. You know, he's like, I filed the right motions. Uh, but even if I didn't file the right motions, they still should have given it to me anyways. Walked around with all of these police officers. They had that video footage. I didn't get it. It wasn't disclosed to me. It wasn't provided to me. I requested it. I filed the requisite pleadings for it. And whether I did or not, they had a duty, an absolute duty, with zero discretion to provide it Yikes. to me. Now, I haven't, so looked, that that, I I haven't looked that up. My anything, client. I so, so very, very simple question. This is, it's shocking that this could happen and happen with the knowledge of Liz Cheney and Adam Kinziger and Chuck Schumer and all the ghouls around the story. How can this man still be in prison tonight? He's still in jail tonight, right now. Well, it, it's a tragedy. I mean, what's happened is truly a dagger in the heart of our America. We can't, we can't allow it. And but for you disclosing it, and whether it, this isn't about you, this isn't about January sixth. This is about our. This is about our justice system being so compromised. The very integrity and core of that which we wore as a badge of honor for, for the entirety of our nation's history has been rendered a vile, disgusting mess by a Department of Justice that was running amok. And they didn't share the video of my client, the footage of my client with nine officers surrounding him, 
peacefully wandering about, trying to help him, trying to get him access to the, the, the Senate chamber. They didn't because it didn't fit their narrative. And but for you disclosing it, uh, I don't know where we'd be. Well, yeah, why it is. Well, my next question for you is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to file a complaint against the prosecutor? I mean, they you're going to file a complaint with the judge. I mean, they totally screwed your client. What do you, you know? Why they're attacking you makes no sense at all. Because by doing that, they're shrouding in secrecy or trying to their own assault on democracy. Yeah, I mean, it's dogs barking right. to me. I, speaking for myself, I don't care at all. But I, I feel for this man who I've never met sitting in jail tonight. I mean, it's, it's really he is, beyond me. He is a, he is a tremendous, intelligent, peaceful man. All right. Well, I hope I hope he does something about it because he was on the case and, you know, he has his case files. He has his notes. He knows what he filed. And if the government didn't actually disclose critical information that might exculpate your client to you, that's a problem. You could file a bar complaint against a prosecutor, file <laughs> a, 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 a big a big slew of motions to reopen that case. We'll see if they do anything about it, but I'm not so sure that they will. Now, we've got more to get to, including this wild conversation with Tucker and Glenn Beck. I mean, it's kind of shocking that Tucker is sort of like the only person in the media who's really putting out the lightning rod to attract the attention on this issue. We, of course, are going to get there in one quick minute right after we talk about our friends from fieldofgreens.com, which is where you can get your real organic superfood because we would all like to lose some of those leftover pandemic pounds, but we are all sick of the ads for weight loss pills and diet pills and all of that stuff. We've all been there. We've all done that. And we know that they don't work, but you know what does? Eating your daily servings of fruits and vegetables every single day, you do that and the weight would probably just start falling right off. But look, Fruits and vegetables, who's got time to prepare that and eat that every day? You don't have to. Instead, let's talk about Field of Greens. Now, Field of Greens is a science-backed formula, very specific fruits and vegetables you're not going to find in any other product. And proper nutrition reboots your metabolism, so you burn calories faster and lose weight the healthier way. And Field of Greens is the only brand that's backed by a better health promise. You are going to look healthier and feel healthier, but the greater proof is going to come at your next doctor visit. When you show up and they say, you look amazing, whatever you're doing, keep it up. And so let's get you started today. Go on over to fieldofgreens.com, get your real organic superfood, save 15% when you check out with code Robert. Don't forget to use code Robert so that you can save. The vegetables want to be eaten. They're disappointed when they just, you know, sit in the cabinet. They want to help you be healthy and nutritious. And so get your real organic superfood, fieldofgreens.com. And don't forget to use code Robert. All right. And so going back to Jacob Chansley, I had questions about the number of videos that were included or that were included at his sentencing. So this is what this is one of the most recent filings in the Jacob Chansley case. On October 13th, Chansley in his case, this entity called CNN broadcasting all of these other entities asked for permission to get his sentencing video exhibits, okay? When Jacob Chansley, he took a plea deal and they sentenced him to over three years in prison and they submitted video exhibits, the government did. And this is the motion the government is asking for those, uh, the, uh, the, the, the media is asking for those videos to be released. And what was curious about this when I was reading this is not necessarily that they want the videos, but more that it was 12 videos that were included. And where did I see that? Here it is. With its sentencing memorandum, the government submitted 12 video exhibits called the video exhibits, right? So these are the government video sentencing exhibits. So my point is, what were those videos? And we know videos were included in the sentencing. Why didn't the defense have the opportunity to present their side of the videos? 12 videos, you know, when you, when you sentence somebody to prison, you typically have letters and mitigation and people speak. Jacob Chansley gave this big long talk about how he's changed and all that stuff. The government submitted videos. The defense didn't get any opportunity to submit any videos. And this was just granted actually. So the defense 
uh, that the media got their hands on all of those video video exhibits. But the highlight reels can be used for sentencing and for el escalating the charges, but not so much for mitigating them, I guess, is the standard coming out of the DOJ now. It's pretty shocking, but there are a lot of people continuing to screech about this. One of them is Adam Kinzinger, and this was a surreal clip. Adam Kinzinger was on the January 6th committee where they literally selectively clipped out bits and pieces of the January 6th riot, and they used it for their own narratives for political purposes for years. This is what he had to say. How do we get that bigger and bigger dopamine hit? And you see what Tucker Carlson does. He, he takes any, I mean, I could take footage from World War II and find like a little piece of that and convince somebody it's the moon landing because uh, well, you can find anything. I thought about, I mean, hours. look, Look at like Vietnam, you know, there's plenty of footage of Marines and soldiers at their bases, uh, you know, hanging out in Saigon, uh, you know, in off time. I mean, you can take video of anybody in the course of a day when something is not happening. And then if you can't say that the Vietnam War wasn't violent and people weren't getting killed. I mean, it's ridiculous. These people are nuts. Do they realize they're talking about themselves? That's what they did. They took an entire event that was mostly peaceful. We ran the numbers on yesterday's show. If you missed that one, go find the real J6 numbers. They're not even real. It's 950 defendants. Less than 300 of those defendants were, were of a violent variety. Less than 100 were of a, quote, serious violent variety involving weapons. And we know that many of the weapons were flagpoles and water bottles. So... If you assemble it all and look at the convictions, I know what they show you on the videos. I know they show you clips after clips after clips. Look at the numbers, their own numbers. It's been two years, less than 1,000 defendants as of 2023, January. 950 defendants, that's nothing, literally nothing for uh, the entire DOJ and the FBI to investigate. So what did they do? They took from a pool of Let's, how many people were there? Conservatively, 100,000 people. They got 99 violent crimes out of 100,000 people who were there. That's the crime of the century, the worst thing since the Civil War. Give me a break. So literally, Kinzinger, Cheney, Thompson, all they did is went and hired out this Hollywood producer to come out, concoct this narrative for them, clipped everything, added in sound effects, looped the Howley clip over and over and over, tried to memify the whole thing. They created the big lie. They are the propagandists they're so worried about. He wants World War II analogies. That's what they do. They're gobbles. It's the version of that. They're trying to pull this wool over our eyes that this was the crime of the century. It was a four-hour riot. They were back in there the same day. And their police were standing down all over the place. I'm so sick of this crap. And then they say that Tucker was the one selectively editing this crap? They brought a producer in. Tucker Carlson was one dude. They had six or eight hearings on this stuff. Listen to these weirdos. You know, in off time, I mean, you can take video of anybody in the course of a day. Like Jacob Chansley. And you can make him look like somebody who is a monster. And you can spread that on a garbage network like CNN for years. When something is not happening. And then if you can't say that the Vietnam War wasn't violent and people weren't getting killed. I mean, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And, and look, the whole thing is he's disparaging law enforcement, too. I mean, keep it. Disparaging law enforcement by playing the full video. So I guess it's it's an, it's inappropriate to have the full video. Should we not have body cameras if we can't comment on the police or something? These people are just weird. You can see how sort of panicked they are because they looks like he didn't get much sleep last night. Yet. This is Pencil Neck Watermelon Head Schiff, also panicked about these new videos. The power of repetition uh, is such that, you know, people like Tucker Carlson, who know they're lying to the public, can convince tens of millions of people of those lies. Uh, I, yeah, I tell you, it's been really uh, illuminating to me about other periods of history where you had other liars use a powerful megaphone and convince millions that they can't believe what they've seen. Uh, and you wonder how is that possible? And now we see how that's possible uh, when you have people who have no uh, no love of country, no no patriotic fiber, when it's just all about the money. 
um, then this is what happens. And for Tucker Carlson, who has many iterations. It's all about the money. They've been telling lies for years about this. They didn't allow anybody to get any access to the documents or the materials. We've had no process for adversarial proceedings at all. And they're upset that Tucker Carlson released a little bit more footage, just a little bit, a couple minutes. And this is the end of American democracy. Now, it is pretty shocking that we don't hear more from other people in the media about this. I think this should be one of the biggest stories in the nation because this is our entire justice system. This is a giant lie that has been used to weaponize and marginalize Republicans, conservatives, everybody in between, anybody who is not involved with the narrative. They, they're so scared about January 6th, they don't even want to talk about it. That's how petrified they are of being associated with it. When you got this is Tucker Carlson with Glenn Beck. They're talking about other support in the media. And it turns out Tucker doesn't have any. All the tapes. Um, can it did did Fox News, the news department, can they have access to that? Would, would they get access to that? Do you think? I mean, what do we do with these tapes now? Because now it's your word you again. That's a good question. I can, I, you know, we work independently. We work for the same company you've worked here, you know, and, know. but they really are in different silos. I can say that no one from any news organization that I'm aware of, I can't speak for my producers, but that as far as I know, no one has ever, no one ever asked. Can, can, can I ask back. right now? Can I get access to those? But as far as I'm concerned, you can have access to whatever you want. I mean, I personally think that everyone should have access to them. Just I'll put you in touch with my producer uh, who's been dealing with um, the speaker's office for sure. I mean, so why, wait a I mean, minute. So so nobody, nobody from the news department, any news department contacted and said, hey, Tucker, what do you what do you see and what do you got? Nobody. Not one working journalist has texted me directly and everybody in the world, including my UPS delivery guy, has my text. Nobody doesn't have my text. I mean, I should just announce it on your show. Everybody has my text. <laughs> so I am the easiest person to get in touch with. I've had the same phone since 1995, the same phone number. I never change it. I respond to every text every day. So I am not hard to get in touch with at all. I'm not Colonel Kurtz up the Mekong, okay? I'm just sitting in my backyard. And nobody has reached, and, and I was in mainstream journalism for 25 years, so I know everybody. Nobody has asked me. And instead, I'm getting all these texts like, I'm Sarah Ellison from the Washington Post. Is it true that you suck? You know, the White House <laughs> issued a statement today saying you're a white supremacist Nazi. Would you care to comment? Crazy. So nobody cares about it. They're all just sort of abandoning ship. Now, Tucker's getting a lot of castigation for this, and I think it's not without. I think it's entirely without merit, but something interesting just came out and I want to shout out Rumble for flagging this one for us. Rumble shared this link and I think this was Dog, Dog Digger shared this one over. Turns out McCarthy is saying he is going to push to release all of the clips of this, uh, all of the videos. This is the latest, so exclusive. Speaker McCarthy vows full public release of Capitol January 6th surveillance tapes. This came out today, March 9th by Matthew Boyle. Told Breitbart News on Wednesday that he intends to fully release the public footage. Tens of thousands of hours of U.S. Capitol surveillance footage. Comments came during a wide-ranging hour-long on-camera interview. Yeah, McCarthy said. Are those tapes going to be fully released? Yeah. We just want to make sure we go through them all. It takes time. First thing that Tucker said, too, he didn't want to show any exits to cause any problems. We asked the Capitol Police, were there any concerns? This is what he said. Arguably the biggest story of the year so far and the, the media who are all lined up outside this room right now <laughs> trying to get a question with you. Uh, the establishment media are freaking out about this. Your decision to release the January 6th surveillance tapes here from the Capitol to Tucker Carlson. Uh, can you tell us why you made that decision? What was the thinking behind it? What do you think it showed? Well, this is all about transparency. And it won't just be to Tucker. Like any news organization, different people get to exclusives. We watched during the January 6th, CNN would have exclusives all the time. Nice. And nobody complained. CNN actually got to be in the, Sarah, the Statuary Hall for a whole hour 
for their own show. You've watched that January 6th would release only certain tapes. I think it's better for transparency that anyone All can make it. their own decision up. And as we walk through these, these are many more hours of tapes than the January 6th committee told us. It's not 14,000, it's 42,000 hours. We wanna make sure for security purposes, or certain exits aren't shown at others. But you know the most interesting thing, when I sat down, when I, I had the team talk to the Capitol Police about making sure they had no problems with the exit is showing, they said January 6th never asked them that. They showed the exit of the vice president. They showed the exit from my office. They literally had then Speaker Pelosi's daughter showing the secure location that they take the leadership. Yeah, That's not the security to be thing is just a red and herring. And reported it. And I don't remember the press ever getting upset with that. So what we want to do is make sure we have this out that everybody can see it. As Tucker Carlson rolled out several of these tapes, uh, uh, he made a very compelling case that the January 6th committee lied to the American public. Totally. Uh, the, the Democrat run committee, which I know you've been very critical of. What do you think? Do you think the January 6th committee lied to the public? Do you think that these tapes show that? Well, I think I haven't been able to see all the tapes yet, mm -hmm. but the one thing I did know, there were certain things the January 6th committee did that I knew was purely political. First, yes. not letting Republicans on the committee. Yes. Secondly, they made accusations that we knew were not true. They, they said um, one Republican congressman gave a tour well, the tapes show he did not give a tour. But you know what? One of the Democrats on the January 6th committee did give a tour in the Capitol the day before. Um, we watched <laughs> different accusations they made. That's why I think Perfect. transparency answers all that. That's not my job to sit back and say whether they were right or wrong. But my job is to be transparent and people can make their own conclusion. One of the really compelling tapes is shows the what they call the QAnon shaman or whatever, right? Like the guy who was dressed up in some really fun. All right, so we'll leave it there. I'll invite you to go watch the rest of it over at Breitbart. But some very good stuff. It seems, sounds like it's coming out of there. Full one hour. I got to tell you, I'm pretty happy with McCarthy. He's He's holding his own and he's taking some of these high ground maneuvers where he's calling for transparency. No, it's not going to be political at all. We want everything out. If you happen to see that the Democrats are liars and that the January 6th committee was filled with partisan hacks who had no interest in getting to the bottom of anything, uh, well, then that's your own conclusion, your own prerogative. But that is not anything that Tucker or that uh, uh, many Americans will believe when the truth does come out. So that, my friends, is it for us then uh, on the day. And of course, we covered some good ground here. We got some updates on Tucker. We got some Chansley updates. We learned about his lawyer and some interesting things going on that he never got any actual evidence, he says. We talked about Pozzola and his motion to dismiss, which is just juicy. And we're going to see what the government says. Prosecutors will respond to this. The trial will start back up on Monday. We should have a whole slew of new filings back then, and that should be fun. We also had Nordine, the notice of impeachment. We learned a lot about the Jenks material, and we know trial is going to be on day 35, coming back on Monday. And so that, my friends, is it for us on the day. And let's see what you have to say about this over from our friends at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We had some super chats come in our friends on Rumble, our friends on Twitter, all across the fruited plains of the internet. Let's get some stuff queued up over here and see what we have. So we had a couple super chats come in, I think. Let me do a refresh on this screen. I think I saw one from Zulu. We did. Hey, we had one from, from Fred as well. Here, we had a couple. Fred Pedamontes here with his dog, Johnny. He says, Rob, Johnny confessed today. He said, quote, I unlocked the magnetic doors on J6. Calling Jim Jordan and telling him everything I know about the Democrats and lies. I was a tool. They used me because I'm super cute. Typical Democrats. Typical. Using the memory of dead police officers called Brian Sicknick and exploiting little puppy dog Johnny. I doesn't, I doesn't, I wouldn't put it past them for a minute there, Johnny. Somebody had to do it. Johnny's, Johnny's a rascally little fella. Well, he's probably going to get picked up by the FBI. So good luck to you, Fred. You know, everything that Fred shares with us about Johnny, it usually results in 
an FBI raid. It doesn't really matter what it comes down to. Epstein, uranium, Iran, you know, whatever he's involved in, it's it's always FBI. I think it's just, you're, you're just better just get a hotline or something. All right, so Zulu says, at Box Lane Production, Super Chat works fine. Well, thank you, Zulu, for testing out and confirming that the Super Chat does work. It does indeed work. Thank you, Zulu, for testing it. And shout out to Box Lane Productions as well. Chris was here with the super sticker. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for supporting us. It's good to see you there in the chat. Grateful for all of you. We also want to shout out our friends on Rumble, of course, who is in the chat over here. I wanted to th say thanks to Dog Digger. Dog Digger gave us that McCarthy tip. Very convenient. Army Brat says, great tip, Dog Digger. Yeah, help the show live, man. It helped, uh, helped me put a nice little end cap on this thing. So thanks for, for sending that in there. Federal rules or criminal procedure from R.D. Howard. Horse riders in the house. Army Brat, Eric Scorpio. Look at our Rumble chat, baby. It's live. It's lively over there. So if you're not tuning in to us or, or joining us over on Rumble, come and join us over there. Annie, get your guns in the house. Adelia's in the house. It's good to see everybody. So that is, yeah, I agree. Trust two kids says, want to see all 41,000 hours of the tapes right now. Here's a question. Uh, R.D. Hayward says, Robert, what is the process of withdrawing plea withdrawal? I know, uh, well, it's a really tough process to do. So withdrawing from a plea deal is a very tough process. It's a great question. That's from R.D. Hayward. So think about it like, if you've accepted a plea deal and it's closed and you're sentenced and it's done, it's very hard to undo that. There are There is another mechanism if you wanted to look into it. It's called a petition for post-conviction relief, which is a different sort of rule that allows you to reopen a case. That's the better mechanism. So if you're, if you're interested in that, that's really what I, you know, I, I suspect a lot of J6 defendants are doing. If you are a J6 defendant and you have been convicted, you, you know, be talking to your lawyer about that post-conviction relief, whatever that looks like for you, you would talk to them about that because that's how you would reopen the case. You can't appeal a plea deal. If you, let's say if you took a plea and you were not sentenced yet, typically the way this works is there is a little bit of an area uh, where somebody might be able to withdraw. So you could, you could actually say, I'm going to plead guilty today. Then you, you come back for like 30 days for sentencing. Sometimes you've seen this in some of the trials we've covered. And then at that sentencing, there's a, you know, uh, a sentencing report that is typically done by probation. They assess what they think you need. They make a sentencing recommendation. Everybody comes and then makes a recommendation. The judge sentences you. But if you've taken the plea and not been sentenced, you might be able to undo that. But yeah, I mean, when you go through a plea, they really, really, really force you to acknowledge what you're doing. Nobody promised you anything. You really want to do this. Are you sure? Did you talk to your mother about this? All right, we're going to accept it. And there's nothing you can do. You understand that? Yes, I understand. Okay, sign here, put your fingerprint here. Uh, give us, you know, one of your kidneys and then you're done. So it's really hard to undo it. So petition for post-conviction relief. I think there's another reason. The, the, the better way to do it is to not, you know, do it before you get the conviction, which is what you're seeing them try to do in the Proud Voice case. So good question from our friends over on Rumble. And appreciate you guys. Okay. We also want to check out our friends on Twitter and see what else is going on over there. Do we have anybody watching on Twitter? We do. Holy moly. We do. We got five people. Yes. It's out of control. All right. Let's see who's in the house over on Twitter. We got Paul Mino at Sleepy Dog Lee. He says, make sure you don't forget to forget to mention that tomorrow is Meme Friday. Yeah, we're going to do some memes tomorrow. It's on Meme Friday and our locals after party and YouTube members join our telegram. The telegram is in the telegram is in the community uh, tab on YouTube. So if you're a member on YouTube, don't forget to look there. And thank you, Paul. Can't touch this meme Friday. And that's me. Yeah, I have, I have a couple of colors of that in my closet. I have it in, uh, uh, uh green. I have it in field of green too. Field of Greens Green. I have it uh, in, my, in my closet. 
it's a, it's a little inconvenient, you know. It's hard to walk through doors, but Hollywood loves it. Uh, <laughs> Jason says, painful. Uh, painful indeed. All right, here's another one. Pencil neck watermelon head. There you, there you go. And yes, <laughs> that's, that's who we talked to today. James Pepper is saying the FBI usually presents spreadsheets printed over itself several times and a PDF format instead of an Excel. Hilarious. We got Brenda's in the house. Good to see you, Brenda. Salt Farmer's over here. Says, you put on some incredible shows, my man. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Salt Farmer. My question is, do you think there's any chance we'd see any FBI members arrested from these J6 trials? Uh, no. No, honestly, no. Do you mean like for falsifying evidence or incriminating, you know, re no, they've all got qualified immunity and the DOJ and the FBI is not going to prosecute themselves. They're probably all going to get commendations and medal of honors. Uh, you know, not, not, you know, their, their version of that, not to diminish the sanctity of the medal of honor, but you get my point. Al Holman says, nice explainer on Jenks. Gracias. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Al. Yeah. It's kind of, it's an important concept that I don't think gets enough, uh, conversation. Che Govea. <laughs> yeah. Che Govea. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Che Govea, baby, man. You know, I'm going to have to grow a hairdo out like that. Che Govea. That's a good one. I like it here. Norm McDonald's giving us the laugh face. It's a good one. It is funny. Yeah. There was some other news. I mean, there was a ton of news today. We couldn't even keep up with all of it. We had the Twitter hearings. We had COVID hearings. We had China hearings. We had oversight hearings. We had all sorts of madness. It was it was a ton of fun today. Hey, Zulu and Dolphin fan says, uh, Robert, here is $10. Take the bus. Go get those tapes from Tucker and buy yourself a Happy Meal. <laughs> all right. I'll try to do that. Uh, let's see here. Where was that comment? That's a great idea. I like that idea, actually. I'm inspired. Take the bus. I haven't ridden a city bus in, gosh, a long time. Maybe too long. What's it like now? It's probably, is it better now than it was back then? It was a little rough back then. I used to take it to high school, but uh, now let's see how it is now. And Tucker, he probably he probably wouldn't mind getting on a bus either. So we'll just uh, do a little field trip on some buses. Thank you, Dolphin fan. And also want to say thank you to Zulu. Zulu invited five new members over to our community, which is super cool because we have a lot of fun. We do member only morning streams where we hit the headlines. We're going to hit one tomorrow. We'll see what is in store for the day get our bearing straight. So if you're looking for a little extra, a little extra content and community, don't forget to subscribe and, or, or join as a member. But Zulu brought over, bend over, sweet. Bend over is in the house. We got John Carroll, Chris Banks, James Hicks, and K Mark all came into our community courtesy of Zulu. Thank you, Zulu. Zulu is very generous. And our member only uh, morning streams are getting a lot more lively. Thank you to all the generosity of everybody in the chat. We're grateful for it. And look who's over here. Alan Harkin is over on Rumble. Shout out to our friend. He says, Alan, awesome news you share and explain. Love it. You're a great explainer teacher. Well, thanks, Alan. I appreciate you being here, my friend. Alan Harkin, 1972. And I always appreciate smiley people. You know, people who put their big smile on their profile photos. Shout out to Alan Harkin for doing that. I notice it. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's good. It shows that you're, you know, Shows that you're happy. That's good. That's a good thing. I like it. It's a good picture. All right. And so shout out to all of our friends over there on Rumble, on Twitter. We've got locals. Oh, locals. You guys are so generous too. Let's say hello to our friends. Adesia says this could make a very long documentary. That is true. Absolutely true. And we got this one. From Terry, Matt's mom says, uh, says just because. They, thank you, Terry, Matt's mom. Very nice. Just because, not even any questions. I appreciate you guys. We are going over there to uh, hang out for our after party. If you're a YouTube member, come and join us on uh, Telegram. So hit the community link button and we'll see you over on Telegram. If you're on Locals, we'll see you over on Locals. So you guys don't go anywhere. But everybody else, that is where we will leave it on the day. We did cover a lot of ground. Before we wrap it up, I want to give you the link where you can join us for the after party, which is at watchingthewatchers.com.
www.locals.com. And all members, no matter where you support us, you get access to the private Telegram group. And so don't forget to grab that link. It is for our locals friends. It's right here. Oops. We'll share it like this right there in the chat. And uh, uh, if you're on YouTube, come and join us over there as well. All right. Also, and before we wrap it up on the day, don't forget to shout out uh, to check out our friends over at fieldofgreens.com. Save 15% with code Robert when you check out. They want to be eaten. The vegetables love it. They're very good and nutritious and healthy for you. You'll feel great. They've got a ton of other good stuff over there like collagen and sleep products and health products. It's great. So check them out, fieldofgreens.com. And don't forget to use code Robert on your way out. Also, want to shout out my former law firm. They are doing amazing work over there. Great team of people at 480-787-0394. They're helping good people charged with crimes find safety, clarity, and hope. And so they're available and ready to help. Also want to thank the mods and the meme smiths who make the show possible. We got Vienti Kiss Prime, our friend K Bean. We got Just Cause playing hookies in the house. Ronnie Cole, Zulu, Geo, and Zach Nichols and John Allen are modding the fort down for us over on Telegram. We also have our meme smiths at Sleepy Dog Lee. And Gigum Gigum, who memed the place up for us. We love it. But that, my friends, is it for us. We are leaving it there for the day. If you're a member, we'll see you on our after party, our debrief, and tomorrow morning. But if not, we will be back here tomorrow on Friday to do it all again. We've got a live stream. I'm sure it's going to be busy. We'll have a lot to get to. And I hope to see you there so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Have a tremendous evening, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody.